favorite personal hygiene hack? I never smell. I never smell unless I don't do this. And look at my underarms, you guys. Let me show you the other one. Hold on. And then I'll tell you what I use. Hold on. Yeah. You know what I use? <laughs> Glycolic acid. Put a little bit on a cotton pad. You put a little bit under your arm. It neutralizes smell and it helps with hyperpigmentation and texture. You're welcome. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm kind of curious about your personal hygiene hack. Maybe we'll do a video on that. <laughs> but let's talk about glycolic acid because first of all, I have seen hundreds of hacks that people have been using for glycolic acid. Specifically this ordinary 7% glycolic acid toning solution. It's everywhere and it seems to solve every skin condition. It really does. It's actually, it seems like glycolic acid goes viral every other month for something new. And not, not all of it's bad. Actually, I think that's the most fun thing about this ingredient in some of these hacks is some actually have some validity to it. Some I think I'm like a little oversensitive. I don't, I don't like some of them a lot. I might be an outlier here, but really there are some that can be helpful. So I think in this video, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of glycolic acid, the risks of glycolic acid, but we really want to attack some of these, not attack, address. <laughs> because we like some of these hacks. We wanna address some of these hacks on glycolic acid and see if you should be incorporating them in your skincare routine or body hack routine. So all things related to glycolic acid hacks, here we go. Here we go. Glycolic acid. First off, what the heck is it? It's an alpha hydroxy acid. That's a family of exfoliating acids, which include things like lactic acid, mandelic acid, and others. But glycolic acid is the smallest particle alpha hydroxy acid, which means it penetrates deepest into the skin of all the exfoliating acids, which makes it the most effective, but also carries a higher risk than some of the other ones. So what does it do? Right, so first and foremost, it's an exfoliator. So by breaking up those bonds between skin cells, it can help with texture. It also helps by signaling collagen growth. So that helps with the fine line maybe even wrinkles at certain concentrations, but because of what it is, it can also have some downside. Yeah, so the main risks of any exfoliating acids, but specifically glycolic acid, is that one, it's gonna make you more sensitive to the sun. Now, salicylic acid has not been shown to make you more sensitive, but because glycolic acid is exfoliating the skin, it will make you more sensitive to the skin, sun, and then you also have the risk of over exfoliation. So if you use it too often, it's breaking up the bonds that protect you uh, from all types of things that is gonna increase your risk of irritation, allergy, sensitivity to other products, burning, redness. So you just have to be careful how often you're using it. Right, and so prototypically, this is an ingredient that you might use once or twice a week in the nighttime and it'll help exfoliate your cells. It's kind of like that treat you would do on the days you're not using a retinoid and that's how it's classically used. But now we're gonna take a deep dive and look at some of the things that other people have been using this for and let's just see what makes sense. People have come up with all these insane hacks. Let's talk about the first one because it's the one that's in this video so we'll address it first. Using glycolic acid as a deodorant or as an armpit treatment in general. Glycolic acid as an armpit treatment, what do we think? We feel strongly about this one. I do, I, I do. And you're like not as strict as I am with skincare. <laughs> you feel strongly about this. I don't know why, I think it's just the whole deliberate thing. So we said first already, glycolic acid first and foremost is an exfoliant. That's its primary function. So when you look at deodorant or a deodorant and antiperspirant, which is what you're using a deodorant and antiperspirant, where does an exfoliant fit in here? And it really doesn't. That's why I think it irks me. The exfoliant part actually has no purpose. What you're using this for when you're using it as a deodorant is actually the antimicrobial properties. So like, can it kill the odorific bacteria that convert those oils into scents and smells? Absolutely, I think it's reasonable. I just don't think it works as an antiperspirant. And I think because it's primarily an exfoliant, it's irritating in that sensitive area. I Agree with this here. So, I mean, scientifically, right, odor in the armpits is caused by bacteria on the skin. I and mean, when I tell patients this all the time, they're always mind blown. It's something that I learned during my dermatology training is that you actually secrete your sweat odorless. And then it's bacteria on our skin that turns it into an odor. And so by using an exfoliant or glycolic acid specifically that makes it uninhabitable for these bacteria, you decrease that bacterial burden, you decrease the odor. So theoretically it works. And that's why there have been studies <laughs> that have shown that lemon can also be used as a deodorant, not an antiperspirant, but a deodorant. Those are separate things. The other piece here is that it is an exfoliant and we, I actually see this a lot. I don't know how often you see this, but um, armpit dermatitis, redness and irritation specifically just in the armpit. And these are what we call the intertriginous areas. And these areas, they're like body folds. You get a lot of friction, you get a lot of moisture, you got a lot of pressure. And so anything that you put in these areas 
are going to be like occluded. And by occluding them, it increases the risk of irritation. So anything you put there is at higher risk of irritation. So now you're taking something that's already irritating and increasing its irritancy potential. And so you have to be careful of getting this armpit dermatitis. Now let's talk about using it for dark armpits. So this makes a little more sense to me because when we talk about dark armpits or darker other areas on the skin, like in, uh, on the back of the neck, it makes sense to exfoliate. The pigment's not necessarily from increased pigment making cells or melanocytes in the skin. It's actually a result of the thickening of the skin. So I'm like an exfoliant, okay, that makes some sense here. I can understand why you might use this and how it might be helpful. The only caveat with this again is gonna be that irritation. So I agree. I think using it under the armpits when you have that dark, darker skin underneath the armpits makes more sense to me than using it as a deodorant just because of the risk of irritation. That being said, where do we fall on this hack, yes or no? As a deodorant, I would say no. I think there are multiple other ingredients that could work. I think that the primary purpose of glycolic acid is missed. Um, so just a no for that one for me. For the dark underarms, I think it's okay. I think it's acceptable. Mm, okay, I would say for the armpits, glycolic acid from the ordinary, too high of a concentration to use regularly. But I think if they made a deodorant with a lower concentration glycolic acid, could be beneficial for both things. Otherwise, I think our risk of armpit dermatitis and irritation is just too high. So I'm kind of a soft no on this one. But, okay, so speaking of dark areas on the skin, is there a better place for this? Is there a better role for this lightning effect? I think there is. Another, Hack number two. We actually got asked about this a lot. I've seen it less frequently lately, but the dark elbows and knees thing, and this makes a lot of sense to me. First, let's talk about what this is called. This is called fades or frictional asymptomatic darkening of the extensor surfaces. It has a name in one paper, and this is actually, they biopsied the skin to find, and we did a longer video on this, but they biopsied the skin to show why the armpits and knees get darker. It's because of thickness in the skin. It's not because there's more pigment, it's the skin is actually getting thicker in those areas. So what do we think about using glycolic acid for that? See, I like it here. I think this is an improvement on the dark underarms thing because you are, again, working with the primary purpose of glycolic acid, you're exfoliating, but you're no longer working on a sensitive area that's thinner sensitive skin and is no longer occluded. So I'm all for it. Okay, yeah, I agree. So now we're targeting the primary mechanism, which is like what we always talk about is like know what causes it, know how to treat it. So it's due to increased thickness of the skin. Glycolic acid thins out the skin. It exfoliates that thickened, hyperkeratotic, thickened skin. So absolutely, I think this makes a lot more sense. Glycolic acid would be wonderful for this. You can also use lotions that have lactic acid or urea. So things like the Cetaphil 20% urea cream or the Amlactin 15% lactic acid creams. And you can also use the ordinary 7% solution. So next hack, using glycolic acid, even as this is really good for a toning solution, something thin and liquidy, using glycolic acid to prevent ingrown hairs. Prevent ingrown hairs, okay. So what happens with ingrown hairs? I'm thinking like, so oftentimes what causes them is the hair as it's coming out, it grows and kind of curls up on itself and curls and grows back into the skin, right? It's ingrown. Well, it turns out that glycolic acid has actually been shown to, to break those sulfohydryl bonds that cause the increased curvature of the hair shaft. And by doing that, it actually almost has a hair straightening effect. And by doing that, not in addition to exfoliating the skin, removing maybe potentially an ingrown hair and, and helping to release it back into the universe, it can also decrease the curvature of the shaft, which prevents ingrown hair. So I actually think glycolic acid is a wonderful treatment for ingrown hairs. See, and I didn't know that. So I, he had told me before, but I was like, he's gotta say it because that was a good <laughs> find on his part. I think it's an excellent find. I have this habit of finding like an obscure fact and it's just like one fact from one paper one time that sticks with me and I'm like oh that's pretty cool and then I save it as a nugget for later yeah just to impress Dr. Maxfield for it moments works like this <laughs> well so for ingrown hairs then I think it's you know pretty much consensus I guess again it's location dependent and as to where you're getting where you're getting them but uh, I think approved from my standpoint yeah, absolutely approved. You know, frequency of how you, often you use it, it's always gotta be a consideration. For something like ingrown hairs, I would say you could increase the frequency of it, like especially if it's on the beard or areas like that, you could probably use it like three, four times a week. But if you're using it in the armpits or groin to prevent ingrown hairs, I would use it much less frequently. Now this one is might be the most viral hack that I've seen, hmm. is using it on the scalp for dandruff and the hair as a hair anti-frizz treatment? Like what are they using it for? Yeah, that's actually been one of my questions as well because I, you know, the dandruff one self-explanatory is the one I've seen go viral the most, but then there's always the occasional video that's like, it's good for your hair. 
Um, does it make it softer? Does it make it more manageable? And honestly, uh, so hair care has actually been my deep dive for the past couple of months. It's hard to find literature on hair ingredients and scalp products. I don't know why, it's just not heavily studied. Most are done by the industry, but how could glycolic acid be helpful for the scalp and the hair? So first it would be, be for dandruff. So dandruff is caused by yeast. That yeast causes inflammation. That inflammation causes your skin to become scaly and flaky, right? So that's the, the pathogenesis. Now, if you have scaly skin, I mean, using glycolic acid can help to remove some of that flaking and scaling. So it is treating sort of the last cause of, of dandruff or the last effect of dandruff. But the underlying cause being the yeast, it may make it because it's you know altering the pH of the skin, it may make it uninhabitable to your, to your dandruff causing um, yeast, but at the same time, I don't think it would be a top treatment for me because there have been other ingredients that are actually shown to treat the root cause of dandruff. So, so yes, I think it works in that way, but it's, it wouldn't be my favorite way to use it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's interesting about glycolic acid and its antimicrobial properties, which a lot of ingredients have. Um, there seems to be a lot more iter literature on how it works with bacteria, and therefore you'll see it used in the acne space some. Very, very, very little to no literature on how this works for an anti-yeast, anti-fungus, especially with that malassezia yeast on your scalp. So. Again, like Dr. Shaw was saying, I think there are ingredients that work better to target the yeast. This might help exfoliate some of that scale, um, but not really a dedicated dandruff product in my mind. And what do you think about on the actual hair shaft? Right, so with the hair itself, again, I, it took me forever to find anything with this. And a lot, some of it was just industry studies. So like a company will take a look at glycolic acid, they'll put it up on their website, or they'll actually put the study on there sometimes, which is nice, but it, might have two major things that you're going for it. Again, like Dr. Shaw was talking about how it affects the hair shaft with ingrown hairs, it might also help make the hair more soft and manageable with like a comb through test where they see how well it moves, how easy it is, and also by decreasing friction. Now another study though, because the question is, is it safe for your hair? Who knows, there's like no data. But I did find one study where it talked about as the pH decreases even down to two and down to one, the hair does lose some tensile strength so I think although it might make your hair more manageable, it might make it a little bit more fragile. Again, not a lot of data, but from what we know, and I think reasonably, physiologically, it could make the hair more brittle. It's kind of a trade-off. Again, hair science far, far behind skin science, and so we're trying our best to try to gather this data, but it's limited right now, and we need to do some more studies on this. But I think that for the scalp and for the sha hair shaft, I've seen some benefits anecdotally on social media with it, via with it, via with it. But wouldn't be my first choice right away until we have some studies. Okay, so what the heck happened? Where are we? This has never happened to us before, which is kind of a miracle. That's true, actually. Yeah, that <laughs> is a miracle. The last frame of the last video was just gone. It just didn't upload and it died. So we couldn't let this video sit. It was too much. So the final ruling on glycolic acid and dandruff, yes or no? No. Yeah. For I, me. I'm with you. I think it's no-ish. Like it could perhaps in theory be helpful, but there are other better options out there. Mm -hmm. And for shorter hair, uh, like for the beard or something, I think it could be good for preventing ingrown hairs uh, if you're shaving short hair, but for like longer hair where, you know, maybe fragility of the hair shaft is in question, probably a no for that, but for ingrowns, yes. Yeah, exactly. And there's a big difference between this and uh, citric acid in the hair, huge difference in these two ingredients. Although the scalp loves to be acidic, it doesn't love to be that acidic. So that's it. So that's all things glycolic acid, rating glycolic acid hacks. And interestingly, since we shot that original video, <laughs> by the way, do we look different, better, worse? Are we aging poorly? We need <laughs> feedback on how we look um, comparatively, because this was like maybe two months ago at this point. Yeah. Um, they, the, since then, actually, The Ordinary posted a video about how they have all, people have been like, here, look at this video over here from The Ordinary. Wait, is this Faye about us? There's the video from The Ordinary. So they have actually caught on to your hacks. And so, uh, stop. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we love the hacks. Keep keep up the good work. You guys teach us things. We appreciate all of you. Um, thank you for coming along with us, and we'll see you in the next video. All right, we'll see you next time.